Sometime in the year 466 or 467, the Roman aristocrat Sidonius Apollinaris sat down just outside a town in his region of the Auvergne in southern France in order to write a letter to friend and fellow Gallic noble Avodius. After a digression about his mourning, Sidonius, whose father had been the prefect of Gaul, makes his excuses to Avodius, protesting that he had to pen his response quickly as he was afraid that any delay might mean that his lunch would be served late, a serious danger for the late Roman nobleman. Uh, okay, so his letter, his letter states, quote, all this introduction is to convince you, honored lord and brother, that when I obeyed your requests, I had little time to spare and little leisure of mind and body. Sidonius continues, responding to Evodius's request for a poem, epigramma, of 12 verses suitable for engraving on a large shell-shaped bowl or basin, the sides hollowed out with six flutes, swirling at last to the bottom in their sinuous course, end quote. Once complete, the bowl is to be given as a gift to the Visigothic queen Ragnahild, wife of King Uric, to assure her support for Evodius's future plans, which remain nebulous in the letter. This bowl, if it ever existed, does not survive. However, unlike the famous shield of Achilles, described by Homer in the Iliad, book 18, whose existence is still debated among scholars, the silver bowl with which we are concerned today certainly could have existed in a form similar to that which Sidonius describes. And you see similar forms on the screen. Shallow fluted bowls in the shape of shells survive in at least three collections. The uh, Mildenhall treasure, uh, and this is one bowl uh, from the Mildenhall treasure, as well as the Esquiline treasure depicted over here. Uh, and the Traprain Law Hoard in the National Museum of Scotland, and their fluted bowl is uh, on this corner of the screen. While related to earlier Roman bowls that represent or recast uh, or recall shells, these objects, dating respectively to the 4th and the early 5th centuries CE, all share a distinctive late Roman form that features dramatic and sinuous alternations between flute and groove. The shell shape of the bowl, still a popular form today for silver dishes, makes sense in terms of its decorative appeal, as well as its function as a bowl meant to hold water, either for hand washing at the dinner table or for face washing as part of a lady's uh, uh, toilet or toilette. Similar shell shaped and fluted bowls are depicted in monumental works of art produced around the same time as in the mid-4th century mosaics of Santa Costanza in Rome, where luxury silver vessels, foliage, and birds have exploded out of a Roman still life painting onto the two-dimensional ground uh, of the mosaic. And you see one of these uh, shell-shaped or fluted bowls here uh, with the detail enlarged here. The disturbing arrangement of these vessels forces the viewer to turn his or her head or body to make sense of each object engaging in a physical mode of viewing not dissimilar from the manner in which uh, he or she would be forced to turn a silver bowl to read its inscription in full. None of the extant shell bowls bears an inscription, uh, though each is adorned with, with chaste decoration, as on the Mildenhall bowl on the screen, where vegetal forms decorate the inner uh, ridges here, and a six-pointed star, now today known as uh, Star of David, uh, decorates the middle of the dish. Before he narrates for Evodius the text of the inscription, Sidonius has more to say about the materiality of his epigram, what he calls his epigramma, as text. And you know, my texts, is, my texts are actually not showing up in my PowerPoint right now, so please bear with me. Uh, I, I have them here. In yet another of his characteristic excuses, meant to be taken with a grain of salt, the noble poet blames Evodius for the strict deadline set upon him. Quote, first, you must forgive yourself, you who gave the silversmith more time than the poet, when it is not a secret to you that in the literary workshop, what he calls the officinam literatorum, the verses produced upon the metric anvil, incus metrica, want polishing no less forcefully than any metal. End quote. Here we get a glimpse into Sidonius's construction of himself as poet, a solo craftsman in a workshop, the Latin technical term officinam, of one, 
constructed in opposition to, or perhaps more accurately, in sympathy with, the occupational identity of the silversmith, who, like the poet, needs the proper amount of time to fashion and decorate a work of art. After you hammer the bowl, you need time to smooth out the rough edges, polish it, and perfect the decoration. Here, Sidonius is praising his own composition, whose orality he emphasizes. He, he calls his poem his song, Kanta. But in his self-congratulatory act, we may perceive something deeper about the poet's understanding of the materiality of his text. This conceptualization was complicated and multiply layered, as Sidonius first composes a poem in his mind, physically writes it into a private letter, all the while visualizing it on a silver object, and later publishes it for a wider audience to read in one of his self-edited and published volumes of letters, a process that reverses when we as readers read the letter, and as you see, my text is, is all screwy here, but um, you get the sort of idea as process. Sidonius composes the letter, thinks about the text as an, the poem as an inscription, and then later republishes that entire letter in a collection, and that sort of reverses when we read the text. Now, Sidonius was neither the first nor the last poet to compare one art form to another in antiquity, or to pair an explicitly textual art, such as poetry, with a material one, such as precious metalwork. Comparing the arts was a time-honored rhetorical tradition, especially popular in the Roman period. For example, for uh, Cicero and Quintilian, the art of memory functioned in parallel to the art of architecture. Retors in training needed to visualize the components of their speeches, quote, like the rooms of a house, as Quintilian says. Uh, Philostratus compares the arts in the introduction to his treatise on the art of athletic training, the Gymnasticus, which he wrote in the third century. Quote, let us consider the following things as examples of wisdom, things like poetry and speaking artfully and composing poetry and music and geometry and even astronomy, as long as you don't overdo it, and painting and modeling and all types of sculpting and gem cutting and metal engraving. A, comp a contemporary of Sidonius, Magnus Felix Anodius, Bishop of Pavia, often relates the work of literary composition to the crafts of gold and silversmiths, referring to himself as a goldsmith of language. In his own work, Sidonius frequently uses the metaphors of the poetic officinam, a trope he borrows from Cicero, as well as the metrical anvil, incus metrica, borrowed from the Greek poetic tra uh, tradition, as well as the polished file, lima poliri, a common trope used by Cicero, Horace, Ovid, Quintilian, Pliny, and the list goes on. As David Amhert, the most recent commentator on the text, points out, these metaphors are standard Roman rhetorical topoi. Nevertheless, their regularity does not negate their potency as images of artistic comparatio that explicitly ground text and its production in the material world, and vice versa, textualize the material arts of the gold and silversmith. Interestingly, these sorts of metaphors are not confined to the secular sphere. The image of painting is frequently used in 4th and 5th century Christian hagiographies and sermons as a flexible metaphor for the distinction between the underdrawing of Jewish Mosaic law and the colors of the Christian order, among other concepts. I won't dwell on this particular metaphor today, uh, but we should remember that Sidonius, who later uh, in the 470s became uh, uh, an important Christian bishop in, in Gaul, was familiar with, with the metaphor as well. Back to the letter. As our author says to Evodius, now here's your poem. Well, we have the Latin, but not the, the translation. Okay. Uh, so this poem is written in 12 lines of elegiac verse, the meter most famously used by Catullus and Ovid. Unlike the famous Nestor's Cup, dated to the early 8th century BCE, found on the Italian island of Ischia, which proclaims its own subjectivity. It's one of these speaking objects we heard about this morning. I am Nestor's cup, good to drink from. Whoever drinks this cup empty, straight away the desire of beautiful crowned Aphrodite will seize. So unlike this cup, our bowl or basin speaks in the amorphous collective we, uh, perhaps Evodius's supporters, including Sidonius. The speakers in the poem praise the queenly recipient, Ragnahild, and describe the hoped-for chain of events that follow the gift of the bowl, the acceptance of the bowl by the queen, and of Evodius uh, as client, clientem, as well as the enhanced beauty of bowl and queen, the water uh, inside the bowl reflecting the queen's visage uh, back at her and at the spectator. 
Sidonius' letter makes clear that he envisions the inscription written, probably incised, uh, into the interior of the vessel, either in the hollows of the flutes or on the ridges or, or between the flutes, probably with two lines, so one distich on each flute or ridge running either outwards from the center or inwards from the rim. So uh, this might be hard to make out, but I've sort of done a, a not a reconstruction exactly, but uh, a re-envisioning of what uh, Sidonius might be talking about when he says uh, these uh, lines are supposed to be inscribed either on the flutes or on the, the ridges. In his book, The Matter of the Page, published in 2011, Shane Butler asks of the ancient and medieval book, is the page flat? And Sidonius' silvery page is, is anything but that, anything but flat. Based on our knowledge of late Roman silver and ancient silver in general, this arrangement would have been quite unusual. In general, on round vessels, plates, bowls, uh, inscriptions are placed so that the reader can actually read them while he or she uses the object. Typically, these texts start either at the bottom uh, or the top uh, and run continuously uh, around the rim of the vessel, as on this Achaemenid Persian wine cup in the Freer Sackler Galleries in, in DC, or around the center, as on these 6th century silver uh, uh, the 6th century silver uh, dish uh, from the Sevso treasure, where the inscription runs kind of around the, the center uh, decoration, uh, or closer to the rim, as on this liturgical pattern uh, from the, a, a, a treasure, the Copper Coron uh, hoard, now uh, in, in D.C. This circular format, echoing the material form of the bowler plate, forces the reader to read round the edges, turning the vessel as he or she uh, drinks or eats from it. In the case of the former, as with late antique chalices, the lips of the reader actually touch the inscription, activating the text through, through uh, contact. By placing the text on the rim, the engraver, a craftsman or artisan whom we know was separate from the artist as well as from the composer in most cases, made the inscription more accessible to the reader. Not only was the text closer to the eyes, but it would not be distorted by the bowl's contents, water, or worse, wine a distortion intensified by the highly reflective nature of the silver, uh, nor would it be affected by the curvature of the vessel, walls, uh, exacerbated, of course, in the case of a fluted vessel where you have uh, lots of uh, undulation. Would Ragnahild, and if the bowl did exist and had survived, would we have been able to read Sidonius's inscription off of its bowl, separating the text from its material? Or uh, would she and we be faced with a trying arrangement that required translation back into the written, uh, maybe a penned form, as is lampooned in an 18th century etching by Paul Sandby titled The Puzzle, where English academics from Oxford and Cambridge puzzle over a monumental stone inscription whose line breaks and arrangement disrupt any attempt at reading the prosaic context, content of the English text. So this text really uh, just says, beneath this stone reposeth Claude Coster, tripe seller of Impington, as doth his consort Jane. But you get the idea. They're, they're puzzling it out. Then again, the content of Sidonius' inscription is quite unusual as well. Secular silver objects tend to be inscribed with dedicatory inscriptions, or, as was the case with more inexpensive glass and ceramic objects, with simple texts related to drinking, dining, and generally having a good time. Sidonius' poem does not bear any real resemblance to, to any surviving inscription on a vessel, silver or otherwise. Is this a poem pretending to be an inscription, which Sidonius envisions as a genre game rather than a material text? Might it imply a highly original commission meant to impress the Visigothic queen? Or might we, or even more likely, uh, might Sidonius, simply have been given the wrong technical instructions, as we and he are not engravers of precious metal? We will probably never know the answer, but what is most interesting is that our author recognized this very problem. Sidonius and his contemporaries were aware of the flexibility of poetry and rhetoric, and while they sometimes describe real objects, works that one could have looked at, uh, physically looked at, or held in one's hand, they also play with the, uh, they play with the real, imagining realistic works of art in order to make points about the nature of art, vision, and perception. But we have left the material content of Sidonius's poem behind. The poem begins with another bit of self-congratulatory comparison and, uh, in which the bowl itself is favorably compared to the shell that bore Venus out of the waves. Here, the goddess named for the isle near where she was born, uh, Kithera. So Venus's name is here. 
And I apologize for the, the missing translation again. As on Nestor's cup, the poem begins with, with the goddess of, of beauty and love. Recent commentaries on the poem have had some trouble with this passage due to the sparseness of references to Venus's shell in the Greco-Roman literary tradition. However, as art historians know well, the visual tradition of representing Venus rising up out of the sea goes back to at least the fourth century BCE, and Pliny in his Natural History uh, describes a painting by Apelles of, of this sort of scene. In the Roman period, versions of this iconography are best known from domestic settings, as in this first century CE painting from the House of Venus Marina in Pompeii. By the second century CE, this popular image of the birth of Aphrodite, which had already been alighted with the more raucous image of the marine theosos, or procession, merged with a second image of the goddess, that of the toilet of Venus. This twice hybrid Venus sits in a shell, often borne by tritons, as in our inscription, and styles her hair in a mirror. And here you have a close up with her reflected face. This image was extremely popular across the empire from Roman Britain to Syria, peaking, and its popularity peaked a few years before Sidonius' birth. I won't dwell on all of the many examples that survive, as their complicated series of replications, repetitions, and recursive viewing dis, uh, deserve a book study of book-length study of their own, but show you one of the nicer examples, a mid-third century floor mosaic from Philippopolis, uh, Shabha, in Syria, where Venus sits in her silver-colored shell, borne by two tritons, and gazes her, at herself in a mirror while she styles her hair. She is bedecked with jewels, having fully embraced her queenly persona. While similar images decorate silver vessels uh, from the fourth century, including the patera from the, the late fourth century Esquiline treasure, now in the Petit uh, Palais in Paris, Avodius's bull probably did not bear an actual image of Venus in her shell, though we won't ever know this. Sidonius's comparison between the silver bowl and Venus's shell, a comparison written into the material of the former, is not an ekphrasis of a physical image in front of the reader. Uh, rather, the inscription vividly brings an absent image in front of the eyes of the mind, forcing the reader, Evodius, Ragnahild, and others, to see the visual, Venus, through the verbal, the inscription, in order to compare the absent shell to the present one, which, of course, is our bowl, the bowl itself. Strikingly, the final four images of the poem extend the Venus Im imagery further, uh, turning the Visigothic queen into an image or icon of the goddess of love and beauty. And again, apologies for the lack of the translation, but the last few lines of the poem read, quote, the happy waters enclosed in this bright metal cherish the still brighter face of the lady. For when the queen deigns to touch her face hence, a radiance is emitted from her visage onto the silver. End quote. On their face, the lines seem to convey a simple message. When Ragnahild bends her face down to the bowl to wash her face or to drink, her reflection is present in the water. However, as its emphasis on the beauty and brightness of the queen recalls the Venus imagery at the start of the poem, the lines convert the water-filled silver shell of the goddess into her other accessory, the mirror. Now, as we'll all know, the water as mirror was a powerful and a dangerous substance in antiquity. Its transformative force exemplified by the cautionary tale of Narcissus, who gazed at his own reflection so long that he turned from living to dead. This conversion from shell to mirror had already taken place in Roman art, as on the Projecta Casket, part of the Esquiline treasure in the British Museum in London, a silver hoard that had its own shell-shaped bowl. On this famous late 4th century casket, part of the toilet of a rich Christian woman in Rome, Projecta, uh, this conversion is doubled from the naked Venus, who appears as she did in our mosaic, in her shell holding her mirror, to Projecta as Venus, clad immediately below Venus in gilded robes, while her attendant holds her mirror for her. On the casket, mirror, mirrors, mirror, and the shell has become a throne, uh, a cella curulis, but the casket itself has also become a mirror, a surface that reflects its user both literally, her visage shines on its reflective surface, and figuratively, the commission reflects uh, the patron's classicizing tastes and her paideia. 
The shimmery water in the shiny bowl mirrors Ragnahild's face back at her, as well as at us, the readers, for as we see in the images of Venus, the mirror is not only a private thing, but also encourages display. And in these depictions, the mirror is often uh, turned outwards to show Venus to the viewer rather than to herself, uh, what Rabun Taylor has called the flexed gaze. Uh, and here you can see it's maybe hard to make out, but uh, there is actually a reflection sort of uh, incised and also gilded in, in the mirror on Projectus Casket. The queen, uh, sorry, the poem participates in this aggressive, ref, uh, reflective, and reflexive visuality of the period, what Michael Roberts has called uh, the late antique jeweled style, evident in its play with three different synonyms for the queen's face. Again, apologies for the missing translation. But there are three synonyms used uh, by Sidonius for the queen's face. So we have, uh, we have os, uh, aura, literally the word for mouth, here used metonymically. Also, uh, vultus, vultus, uh, and uh, facies, both of which also imply appearance or even the likeness of the queen's reflection. Others have written on the intense gender and culture politics embodied in the mirror of, of, of Aphrodite in the late Roman period, most notably Rabun Taylor, Yash Elsner, and Shelley Hales, and many more questions could be asked of the gender and power dynamics of the poem, or of the male and female gazes directed at the bowl. For example, is Sidonius's literary icon of Ragnahild as Venus oppressive or empowering, or, as I would probably argue, both? So from letter to inscription to object, back to page. And I think this text is going to be missing too, but I can summarize it for you. Let's see. Yep. Um, after he finishes the poem, the, very, uh, the conclusion of the letter, Sidonius makes an extraordinarily rhetorical move. He negates his own material presence in the poem and asks Evodius to conceal his authorship and depend uh, for, his ex for Evodius's success with the queen on the present of the bowl alone. The shiny shell-shaped bowl becomes a page as well as a letter. Uh, Sidonius uses the word uh, charta to refer to the bowl uh, and also to, to his letter. But the bowl also becomes a mirror, reflecting back cultural tastes and preferences of author, readers, and viewers. While, uh, while Evodius presumably understands the multivalence of the inscribed bowl, Sidonius, and he says this in the conclusion to his letter, he believes uh, that those barbaric Visigoths won't get the text. They won't be able to read it, either because they can't read the Latin or because they won't understand the cultural references contained within the poem. But the letter also reflects the 5th century tension between word and object. Though Sidonius previously set himself as poet on equal footing with the silversmith, here, at the end of his letter, he implies that different audiences with different experiences, tastes, and cultural identities value different things. We might disagree with the accuracy and objectivity of Sidonius' statement. We know uh, that the Visigothic court, uh, for example, loved uh, Roman culture and tried to emulate it. But it highlights the tension between text and object, between different kinds of pages or letters made in different mediums. The reappearance of this tension also reminds the reader of the flexibility of the epigram, moving from the wax tablets of Sidonius's mind to his page, thence to Evodius, possibly to a silver bowl, itself shaped like another object, a shell, back to parchment in the form of Sidonius's books of his letters. I, each of these mediums had a different impact upon the reading of the poem, both in terms of legibility as well as connections forged between, forged between text and medium. For example, Sidonius's comparison of bowl to shell might be less resonant on the parchment page or the, the papyrus page than it is on the silver one, while his play with the materiality of the page might play better on parchment. The, but, but though some mediums were more well-liked by some audiences than others, the fluidity of the late Roman text resonates throughout Sidonius's writings. Even in the age of the Christian logos, when the word of God had become incarnate in Christ as man, other texts continued to move flexibly between material states. Thank you. <laughs>